So the Bank of England announced this week that it will be increasing interest rates to 1% from 0.75%. This is the highest interest rate since 2009, 13 years ago, and it's the fourth consecutive increase since December. At the same time, they've warned us that inflation is set to peak at over 10%, rising at its fastest rate for 30 years. And while we may not have a full-blown recession on our hands, they certainly think that our economic output is going to slow down significantly. So is this the right decision at the right time from the Bank of England? And crucially, what impact will this have on all of us? Here to discuss this is Andrew Lillico, Economist, Executive Director of Europe Economics, Chair of the IEA's Shadow Monetary Policy Committee, tele Telegraph columnist and prominent commentator. Thanks for joining me. Uh, nice to be with you. Appreciate your time. So, Andrew, in your view, is this rise too little too late? Uh, absolutely. I think the Bank of England is uh, well behind the curve. They should have been raising interest rates some months ago. Uh, they uh, boosted the economy too much with the uh, softening of monetary policy a while back. And um, and they should be rising by more to raising by more today. Uh, I think that uh, real interest rates uh, as they stand are scheduled to be at their lowest perhaps since 1975. So what I mean by real interest rates is the difference between the interest rate, that's the 1%, and where inflation is expected to go. So 10% on the CPI measure or 12% on the old fashioned RPI measure. If you were thinking back to 1975, you find it hard to get statistics on the CPI uh, back to then. Uh, so um, we're talking about unprecedentedly um, soft monetary policy, really. It's, um, all the headlines, of course, are about uh, interest rates being at the highest level for a decade. But the reality here is that in real terms, uh, monetary policy is extremely, extremely accommodative at the moment. So why have interest rates been so low for so long? What was the thinking behind that, just to get our viewers up to speed? Interest rates went down to approximately zero at the time of the financial crisis back in uh, 2008, 2009. There were concerns that if interest rates were too high, then there'd be mass defaulting uh, by households on their mortgages, uh, as happened in some other countries like uh, Ireland and Spain uh, back at the time of the financial crisis. Uh, and there was a concern that if that happened in the UK, obviously that would be very bad for the households concerned, but also because the UK had uh, bailed out its banks, that might place the UK in a very difficult position we might have the banks go bankrupt, even though they were bailed out by the state. So um, interest rates went to basically went to an emergency level of approximately zero. And it never quite seemed convenient for them to get back to being normalized. Uh, so uh, over time, that various opportunities arose for the Bank of England to uh, raise rates up a bit, to give themselves a bit of room, uh, but they never took them because they never felt they really had to. In, uh, the inflation was never going to be so low, so negative that they uh, that they felt that they were driven um, uh, to, um, uh, sorry, so high, so positive that they felt they were driven to raise them uh, uh, for quite a long time. And um, the economy was never growing all that fast that they felt that they had to be uh, uh, taking, taking the um, steam out of it by raising rates. So th they never really ro raised them for So it sort of, became, sort of became the status quo and they sort of stuck with it because there wasn't enough to sort of, uh, you know, make them want to, to want to raise them at that point. Exactly. And so at what point do you believe that they, and also the Shadow, Shadow Monetary Policy Committee, um, which we uh, put out your statement, you were asking for it to be raised substantially more than it has been, uh, the interest rates that is. Um, some people would argue, and this is something I've thought about too, is this the right time to raise them? Because at the moment, people are struggling with the cost of living, with higher energy costs and prices of food going up, people are gonna have less money to spend anyway won't that do the job of raising interest rates in a way and won't we see people struggling to pay their debts not least their mortgage repayments well what's what's going to happen is that the uh, the high inflation is going to induce a large enough fall in a household disposable income that we get a recession and the recession will take some of the steam out of the economy give us some unemployment and that will take the edge off the inflation Sure, absolutely. So it's not a very clever way of getting inflation down. Uh, it would have been better if the interest rates had been a bit higher, a little bit earlier, so the inflation didn't go so high, so you didn't get the recession. 
but um, in, you're quite right that that's a thing that's going to happen here. Um, there is a question as to whether the Bank of England might be being optimistic about how rapidly inflation might fall. We've got enormous amounts of um, money sitting in the system after it was printed consistently through quantitative easing for year after year. And it, although they're not adding any more, they're not at this stage saying that they're going to be tightening. Quantitative tightening might be a phrase that we come to be used to as the opposite of quantitative easing uh, over the next few years. So they say that they're having some plans of exactly how to do that, but they aren't doing any of it yet. And so in the meantime, we have an awful lot of money sitting in the system, which could accommodate additional inflation for quite a long period. And one thing I think that is underestimated here in the Bank of England has talked about this a little bit, um, is the possibility that, uh, that uh, workers and businesses don't really believe the bank when it says that inflation is going to come down this quickly. And so they collectively agree to additional wage rises uh, because they, they, their firms want to keep their workers and they will mm -hmm. struggle to keep them if they don't give them enough, enough salary to live on. Uh, and once you start getting those kinds of effects, when you've got a lot of money, sitting in the system to accommodate it, you could find that the inflation sits there for rather longer than the bank anticipates. So instead of it coming down within two years, it might take four years for it to come down. Even the amount of inflation that they've got, I mean, 10% inflation sitting there for that length of time makes a very large difference to the uh, to the level, to the price level over time. In this business of saying, well, it doesn't matter if inflation is only transitory, seems to me to be deeply wrong. I mean, inflation in 1978 was 7.5%, um, uh, 7.8%, I think, and it, then it dropped to um, below 4% by uh, 1983. Well, we don't say, well, inflation went down, so the bank did quite well. And uh, there was just a transitory rise mm -hmm. to a 23% uh, in between, uh, but that was just a transitory rise. I mean, what we think that the high inflation of 1979, 1980 was an absolute economic catastrophe. Uh, and so saying that we, that inflation will eventually come down, so we don't care if it's high in between, and that seems like a very strange, it's almost yeah. the point of monetary policy thinking for an extended period was that that was just the wrong way of thinking about things. And that old, very wrong way of thinking about things seems to have become embedded over time back in, uh, back in policymaker thinking. It's just never quite convenient to stop it happening when the moment comes. And it was things like inflation targets were supposed to be there to, to mean that policymakers wouldn't do things like this. So, well, if it's only gonna be 10% for a couple of years, then we don't mind. And that, I, I find it very odd that people don't seem to care about this. Um, yeah, I mean, we've seen, we've seen um, a lot of commentators, a lot of economists, uh, try to pin this inflation specifically on energy prices, the cost of energy, and then on Ukraine. But you would argue, and the impact that's had on supply chains and the price of goods and so on, and the availability of goods that's driven up some prices. But you would argue that that is partially a cause, but the real cause is the amount of money that we've been pumping steadily uh, into our economy, particularly over the past two years. Yeah, well, the the... Well, I mean, obviously, uh, energy prices were a, a contributory factor. They were a contributory factor to the inflation in the mid-1970s and the late 1970s as well. It was exactly what happened. Oil prices went high uh, and policymakers decided to accommodate that rise. You're not just because uh, energy prices go up doesn't mean you have to accept that that's going to turn into high inflation. You can decide to act against it. But um, but they didn't. Uh, and uh, uh, what could you do thing, to sorry? What what could you do to act against it? Well, you could have raised interest rates faster, for example. You could have raised taxes more. You you didn't have to accept that that, that the inflation was just going to go up. Um, another thing to bear in mind here is that uh, it absolutely is the case that there are significant energy price rises, but they're only about a third of the inflation, even at peak. So the energy price effect of that ten percent. Your own, it's only three percent and three and a bit percent, which is the which is the energy prices. Most of it isn't. Most of it is just the broader effects. Um, okay, COVID recovery as well is another thing going on there, but most of it's just money. And what does what does an economy with ten percent inflation look like? How will people be impacted? How long do you foresee? those kind of inflation rates lasting in this country or do you have no idea well the so what what kind of what kind of economy you're talking about there it's one crucial thing i think is it's an economy in which it becomes very easy for 
workers and businesses to get exactly what inflation inflation in the future is going to be wrong. If inflation is normally 2% and it might be 2.3% and you get it slightly wrong and you think, well, this year it's going to be 2.5%, then that's relatively small kinds of errors. Those sorts of errors don't lead to um, high unemployment in particular. If, if inflation is um, 10% and the workers think, well, it might go to 14% and it actually goes to 3%, or conversely, they think it's going to go to 3% and it actually goes to 15%, those kinds of mistakes make much larger impacts on people's lives. If it goes in the one direction, then you find that um, a load of workers suddenly become unemployed because if the inflation turns out lower than the inflation which you expected and, and hence embodied in wage agreements, mm -hmm. then the real wage rises are very high and the firms can no longer afford to employ the workers. That's exactly what happened in 1980. So in 1980, um, the inflation rate was about 15%. Uh, so it was, uh, yeah, inflation was about 15%. The, the late 1980, there was at the time a Mrs. Thatcher, and her famous, the ladies not for turning speech that you've all, that everybody's seen. Um, uh, the wage agreement was about 22%. So they were expecting the inflation to go to 30%, maybe, certainly much higher than the 15% it was at the time. But then uh, inflation went down over the next couple of years to below 4%. So you ended up with this absolutely massive real wage rise, which then led to 3 million unemployed uh, employment, more than 3 million unemployment for 51 months in a row. So that's the kind of error which you should be concerned about. In the opposite direction, if you agree to, if you expect the inflation rate is going to go down and then it doesn't, then the workers suddenly find they can no longer um, afford their families' uh, budgets, they can't pay their uh, for their um, debts and they start to default and all kinds of ugly things happen as a consequence of that. One other thing I think is is a, a really important here, which I don't think it gets in really in any discussion at all, is this isn't just a matter for the Bank of England. Yes, I was about to ask you, we talk about what the Bank of England should have done to keep that target or keep inflation down. But what on earth should Rishi Sunak be doing? It, we should be asking Rishi Sunak this all the time. We don't live in a country in which we have a completely independent central bank. We live in a country with an operationally independent central bank. That means that the chancellor takes responsibility as a political matter and as a matter, and this is exactly the right thing. He should be taking responsibility because if, if lots of other government policies have an impact on inflation and inflation has an impact on lots of other government policies. So you need to have an integrated approach where the things you do with public sector pay and with taxes and public spending and so on, they, they all have an impact or are impacted by inflation as well. And so what happens is that the chancellor sets the Bank of England an inflation target. Now, what's happened for a long time is that the inflation target that was set notionally was 2%, but then they just missed a lot of the time. We've had something like 30 letters written since 2007. First 15 years of inflation targeting, they never missed the target once, no letters written. The next 15 years, we've had something like 30 letters written um, so far, and we've had inflation go to 5%, 5%, now 10%. And um, it, the, once you decided that there was no disciplining uh, created by the inflation target, then the policymakers felt they kept able to see through almost any change that there was. The so point of inflation targets, it's inflation targets were, came into existence so as to manage the path of inflation down. What Rishi Sunak should be telling us is what inflation rate he thinks is the right number for 2023. He can't do very much about inflation for this year, but he should be telling the bank, I think inflation next year should be 7% or 6% or 8% or whichever one it is, right? Because the, the, the rate at which inflation is supposed to come down, it makes a big difference whether the bank should bring it down via um, from 10% to 8% mm -hmm. and then steps like that or 10% um, to 6% and steps like that. The point of inflation targets was supposed to be to manage the both the policy making environment and the expectations of the workers and so on, which are really crucial for the unemployment that I was uh, mentioning, um, as inflation comes down. And just saying it's 2%, and of course, we don't expect you to meet it. I mean, that's just a completely empty inflation target that we have at the moment. But besides from setting realistic and uh, realistic uh, inflation targets for the Bank of England, what can what's in Rishi Sunak's gift to do about the cost of living? You know, we constantly hear calls for higher welfare payments, uh, subsidies, um, 
and all sorts, also tax cuts as well. And then there's calls for windfall taxes, et cetera, et cetera, on companies that have done well out of the last year or so. What do you think he can do in terms of his day to day policy, in terms of those decisions to yeah. try and help people out? Do you think he can try and help people out? Well, there are other things he can do, but I just want to reiterate the, the setting of the target and the enforcement of it is overwhelmingly the most important thing that he can do. And he doesn't do the most important thing he can do. All these other things are secondary. So there are other things he can do. Of course, he could change tax rates and he could uh, help out. Um, uh, he could change public sector pay and provide signals about that. And he could um, adjust benefits and lots of other little, but they're all tinkering at the edges. He doesn't do the thing which is overwhelmingly the main thing that he should do. So I, I don't mind talking about those other things, but I think they're distractions from the main thing. If you don't actually try to manage inflation, then saying, well, how will you manage the consequences of inflation? is okay, that's a thing, but it's not the main thing. So yes, he should, I, I think that that when we should have an integrated approach. Mm. So what should happen is that once he's established his inflation target, he should then be trying to assist the Bank of England in achieving whatever inflation target he sets through his public sector pay um, so uh, and through his um, uh, taxes and uh, other kinds of things. So he should be telling the Bank of England, this is what your target is. And the tax thresholds are going to go up in line with what I say you should achieve, not something else. They're going to go up with that. The, the, yes. the benefits are going to go up at that rate. Other kinds of things are going to go up according to the rate which I set. But if you don't set a rate, then it's very difficult to have any integration with any of these other policies at all. Yeah, and just lastly, lastly, from your uh, from your role as a political commentator, why do you think he's not doing that? Do you think it's so that he can sort of separate that responsibility in the eyes of both himself, his government, and the public, and sort of so it's not so much down to him? This uh, uh, absolutely, I think that, and I think it's because um, the press have let governments get away with it for a very long time pretending that inflation is somebody else's problem. He doesn't, he, um, whilst the inflation is going up, you want it to be somebody else's problem. Once you, once you, once you get inflation high enough or, and people get angry enough about it, then policymakers will start, new ones will start to say, oh, it's all us, right? As inflation comes down, they'll want to be saying it's them. But when inflation is on the upwards path, policymakers don't like to have responsibility for that at all, but they shouldn't. Politics, commentate, commentary and voters shouldn't let them get away with that. Well, I'm not sure if he will get away with it for much longer. We'll see. Um, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, that was Andrew Lillico, Economist, Executive Director of Europe Economics, Chair of the Shadow Monetary Policy Committee at the IEA and Telegraph columnist and prominent commentator. Thank you for joining me. You're most welcome, Emily. So in a pretty massive week for politics, one of the biggest cultural stories to hit the headlines was, of course, Roe v. Wade. According to a leaked Supreme Court document, millions of women across the US could lose their legal right to abortion. If the court were to strike down the Roe v. Wade ruling from 1973, individual states could be allowed to ban abortion. This could make abortion illegal in almost half of US states, and that's 36 million women. There are already 13 Republican states, such as Utah, Texas and Wyoming, with so-called trigger laws in place. This could lead to an immediate ban on abortion if the Supreme Court rules to overturn Roe v. Wade. Unsurprisingly, another new culture war has erupted. And as we've become accustomed to in this country, any culture war that starts in America immediately crosses the Atlantic to our shores. Here we've seen a renewed debate over the rights and wrongs of abortion even though we have quite different dynamics over here when it comes to the abortion debate. But politicians, commentators, all sorts of people have come out to condemn the potential change in the law, while some conservatives have argued that abortion has become too easy in this country as well. So here to discuss the fallout is Mo Lovett, Program Coordinator for the Academy of Ideas, National Coordinator of Debating Matters, and a regular political and social commentator. Thanks for joining me, Mo. Hi, Emily. Thanks for having me. Now, I just wanted to get a quick comment from you just on what we've seen overnight. We obviously don't have the full picture of what's happened in the local elections. But do you think at this point it looks like Boris Johnson is here to stay? I think probably yes. 
Um, I um, it's partly because I can't see that there's a natural successor. Um, that could have been Rishi Sunak at some point. It could have been Liz Truss at some point. I know she was a Tory favourite um, amongst a, a lot of grassroots conservatives. I don't see their star. Uh, on the rise as much as it was, say, even six months ago. Um, and for that reason, possibly, I mean, you know, ever since Boris kind of coalesced and backed that Brexit vote, he's had, you know, people within the Tory party gunning for him. We've seen that constantly. And uh, obviously the media are no friend of Boris as well. But um, yeah, that will continue. That will continue. That kind of wrestle uh, for power within the Tory party and actually, you know, within the country at large will continue. But I, I think he will hang on. I mean, it's um, it, this is a local election. You know, I know people see it as a litmus test, but it's not mid terms. We're not America. Um, so, you know, people do vote for different reasons. And it's interesting that um, Boris has lost those three um, London constituencies that he that the Tories desperately wanted to hold on to, but that Labour haven't made the significant gains in the red wall um, that they hope to do. I mean, obviously, we're still in the middle of the results coming in, um, but it doesn't feel a decisive win for Labour or a decisive loss for the Tories at this stage of, you know, where we are in the election, the general election cycle. Yeah, I'm not sure Keir Starmer will ever be able to win over some parts of the country just by virtue of who he is and how he comes across. And of course, people won't, not all people will forget uh, the role he played in uh, Brexit or at least uh, attempting to thwart it in many people's eyes. And of course, backing, backing Jeremy Corbyn for prime minister does uh, leave a uh, sour taste in some people's mouths, I guess. Um, so what do you make of the prospect of the landmark ruling? of Roe v Wade being overturned by the Supreme Court. It's hardly surprising that this has erupted into such a fierce debate, is it? No, it hasn't, particularly in the United States. As you say, it's part of a broader culture war as well, or it's certainly kind of been reinterpreted in those ways. It's worth, worth making the point that in 1973, it wasn't as much of a culture war issue. It's certainly more depoliticized than it is in Europe and, and in the UK particularly we see it much more as a political issue than a cultural issue it's always been to a certain extent a cultural issue in the United States um, but it's very interesting that it's now much more framed in terms of the culture war in terms of intersectionality in terms of identity politics that we've seen right across the board in our kind of current uh, political climate you see less kind of vociferous defense of female autonomy or, um, you know, women's right to choose what they do with their own body. And um, that was very much kind of part of the debate in 1973 and had been fought for decades. But it's much more now swathed in terms of the culture war, as you say, and um, perhaps not seen so much as a political point about women's freedom and much more a kind of culture war point and, and, and the morality of whether abortion is right or wrong. Um, and I think that's a significant change. Whether or not that translates to a UK context um, is difficult to tell. You know, we know that we import a lot of the culture war, wars here, but it, it has almost always been seen as a women's health issue in, in the uh, United Kingdom, um, where women's access to safe and legal abortion has been part of that conversation about women's health. Um, so, yes, how it will play out, you know, here is different, but it's incredibly worrying that this is supposedly the bastion of liberal democracy and um, that, as you say, you've got 26 states, I think, poised um, to ban abortion or certainly restrict it so heavily that it becomes difficult for people. And, you know, I was looking at the figures um, earlier about how many women have abortions in the UK, it's roughly about 200,000. Um, and in America, it's roughly about 800,000. So, you know, it, when you think about the scale or the rate of abortion, so I think we have to remember this is not something that women choose to do with glee. Abortion is really, if you like, the last stop in bodily autonomy when contraception fails. It's not a, it's not an easy decision for women. It's not that people are happy about the fact that 800,000 people in America have abortions, but it is, if you believe in freedom, autonomy, bodily sovereignty, which we talk about a lot since Brexit in this country, then abortion is that last mainstay for, for women to have that um, freedom of their of choice for their own life. When you say it's become part of the wider culture wars, do you mean that those who are seen as being pro-choice 
are perceived as having other ideas that go along with that point of view and then on the other side so people assume that your stance on abortion will also uh, sign you up to xyz as well in the culture political arena do you know what i mean yes i do know what you mean and i think tribalism is a big problem in terms of politics and morality because it doesn't allow us to differentiate on different issues so you know i've seen a lot of commentators saying where were feminists about bodily autonomy when there was mandatory vaccines mm. yeah so you, you see what you end up with i think when when the culture war takes hold of an issue you end up with a a kind of uh, charge and counter charge of hypocrisy all the time when actually and that's because the culture wars are not really rooted in um, moral conscience, they're much more rooted in, in some kind of seen to be saying the right thing, the, the kind of virtue signaling thing. So it, it does become, you know, inconsistent that you can have bod people arguing for bodily autonomy in terms of mandatory vaccines, but don't, don't wish women to have the right to have an abortion and, and vice versa. So I think, you know, this is where, where it becomes a culture war, where, where people aren't necessarily thinking about what is the nature of a moral choice? Um, you know, the whole point of the, the Roe versus Wade and the, the um, using the 14th Amendment was that the, the US Constitution pro provides a framework in, in, in a sense, a sort of boundary over which the state can um, interfere in, in somebody's right to privacy and their own moral decisions. And, you know, but it, on that on that, is it could it not be argued that this is actually more democratic insofar as it devolves that decision making to the individual states. Yeah, I mean, that has been argued and I see people arguing about it. I mean, it's very complex. I mean, for a start, there's, a, you know, if you think about the Republic of Ireland, they had a referendum that, you know, democratic decisions are taken and I'm all in favour of democratic decisions. However, we, the difference between the, um, our country and the United States, for instance, is that sovereignty is enshrined in a constitution in a legal document it's why i'm probably not in favor of a, of a written codified constitution like the united states because um clearly when when the constitution was drafted women's rights were not at the forefront of the founding fathers um uh, you know thoughts and also you know safe abortion wasn't necessarily as an option as it is today so um, so, but, so you've got this kind of sovereignty enshrined in a document, and it had to be interpreted in 1973, Roe versus Wade, through that document and through the 14th Amendment and the right to privacy. So that's where it gets uh, where it gets difficult. Is that um, if you if you were to argue along the let's not make it a federal matter, let's make it for for the individual states. Actually, what you're doing is you're still in inviting more state interference into what essentially has been. Um, argued to be a private decision, a moral decision. And it's quite interesting to see Republicans who, you know, want to see the state rolled back, arguing for more state legislation, more interference in a woman's rights. Um, and um, so that's why um, yeah. it's much more complicated than just democracy versus, um, you know, sovereignty uh, in the Constitution. Um, I think we have to make the point that what a woman chooses to do with her body, and she doesn't do it, I just want to stress this point, no woman has an abortion without having a real moral quandary about it um, has to be has to be hers and hers alone. Yes. Now, I hear that and I agree with you uh, largely where I find it difficult is I've seen representatives of the Democratic Party essentially advocate for abortion up until birth, essentially. And I find that very troublesome. I would probably argue that we've got it about right in this country, the 24 weeks, I think it is, because at some point, the individual autonomy and respect for the newborn life must trump the woman's choice over her own bodily autonomy in that way. Would you agree? Or do you think that essentially abortion should be um, available to women? I, well, I, I'm like you, that, that that would make me incredibly queasy if we were talking about really late term abortions. However, you are completely in sync with not just what has been felt as a settled matter in the United Kingdom, that 24 weeks uh, important date, because it's about the viability of the, the fetus to live outside the womb. But also with the American public, you, you know, it, if it came down to a democratic vote, 61%, I think, are the latest figures. I mean, it's gone higher and it's gone lower in terms of that 24 weeks um, uh, 
uh, limit um, does seem to be where the democratic sentiment lies. But again, I think it comes down to really um, a matter of principle as to whether or not you think this is a, this is an area in which the state has a right to kind of rule on what is essentially a very personal, very moral uh, conscience, individual conscience decision. So, um, but, you know, talking about the um, the late term abortions, and there's even been some kind of postnatal arguments as well, uh, being made as well. I think this is where, um, this is where the culture wars in this kind of tribal politics really does obfuscate the issue in a sense, because, you, you know, it ends up with people arguing, you um, that you know, on one side, that men want total control over women's bodies, or on the other side, that you know, all these feckless women want to 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 abort on the day. Yeah, it's of far too ideological, isn't it? It is, and I think um, you know, I, you know, I think we're going to go on to talk about some other issues as well. But I and and thinking about the local elections today, the thing we didn't say is how bad the turnout was, mm. and I think you know, we demean politics by um, having these kind of tribalized culture issues and not dealing with nuance it's why I do debating matters if I may put a plug in for that you know to have 16 to 18 year olds looking at two sides of an issue but looking at all the gray in between and seeing that there are deeper more nuanced arguments to be have had so I think it's quite demeaning when we when we result to these kind of polar opposite views in order to to attend to a, a you know a real life issue um you know you we talked about earlier you know there there are triggers there are trigger laws waiting in states across america as soon as it if uh, Roe versus Wade is overturned, and it looks very possible that it might be, that they will instantly ban abortions. But also Louisiana have said that they would ban any type of emergency contraception, IVF treatment, um, you know, women being able to use the, the coil. So, um, so you know, this is this is a massive issue. It's a massive issue for the United States. And as you, as you said yourself, these things can ripple out as well and raise the kind of argument um, across, the, across the kind of Western world when as we've said it was a settled issue you know it felt that people were more or less comfortable most people were more or less comfortable with the way the abortion laws already stand yeah and uh just one thing really just looking at at this country and something that was going to affect women at it was one of those pandemic measures that was brought in essentially women were free to uh, take at-home abortion pills freely uh, at home rather than having to presumably go to the GP or a pharmacist or something uh, where they would get it. And there was a debate about whether that should be kept on. I believe MPs voted in favour of it being kept on and it actually led to uh, shorter, um, well, women were getting abortions earlier. So that's a lot of people would see that as more moral and ethical that people are getting abortions earlier in their uh, pregnancy. Uh, what do you make of that debate? Uh, for me, I think the state should shouldn't really have any opinion on that. If it's at a legal time within your birth, we should be making it easier for women. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you know, this is this is um, one of the problems with abortion. It's not. It's not an easy decision for any any woman to make or a, any partnership to make. You know, quite often this is we the the debate is talked about feckless women. They should have used contraception. You know, they they don't value life and all the rest of it. This is quite often something that couples have to decide together and um, with a wider family. It can be a, a real kind of a, angsty decision. I think the debate over um, using the um, abortion pill at home was actually one of those rare occasions where there was a decent debate. And as you say, it was um, it was upheld that women could to, could do this i mean you still have to go into a uh, hospital to to have the fetus removed if you like you know there are still procedures but it means that you're not constantly part of this kind of um making life difficult for women and i think this is some of the things that what what's happened in the united states since roe versus wade is individual states have made it increasingly difficult um they put all sorts of moral structures um including the strictures including things like having to have a a, a pre-abortion scan to you know so you can see the fetus inside you which is completely medically unnecessary or that you have to go for um abortion training and then wait 72 hours so again 
again, it's this thing. This is already a difficult decision for women. Why on earth does the state think it has the right to make it even more difficult? And I think that was the suggestion behind saying that women couldn't take the pill at home. Yeah, for me, uh, I wish in an ideal world that no woman had to go through an abortion and that it is regrettable that we have so many abortions. I do believe that. But ultimately, you can never ban abortion. You can only ban safe abortion and making it more difficult for women at an already traumatic time, I think, is deeply immoral and unethical. Well, thank you so much for joining me, Mo. Thank you, Emily. Really appreciate your time. Nice to be here. Thanks for watching The Double Take with me, Emily Carver. If you enjoyed this video, please do give it a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel and leave a comment below. Thanks for watching.